Hello and welcome to Young Explorers. I hope you're doing well. This is actually our 10th episode that we've managed to put together. And we're going back to our normal format. If you weren't with us last week, what we did is I had an interview with Thomas. So if you haven't already, I'd advise you to go and check that out. So what we're going to do today, we're going to be continuing to look at the life of Jesus, where he was accused of being demon-possessed. But first of all, we're going to go to a segment which I've called, What Do We Believe? Welcome to this segment of What Do We Believe? Today, we are going to consider the early church fathers. Now, you may have never heard that phrase before, and even if you have, you may be unsure as to what it means. Put simply, the early church fathers are Christian writers and leaders from the early centuries of Christianity, ranging from the first century, during the time of Christ, all the way to the end of the 4th or 5th century. Other than some of them having cool beards, why is it important to learn about the early church fathers? Well, it's always important to learn about history, to see the things that others have struggled with, and we can learn how Christianity spread all around the world and see some of the challenges that Christians faced. From a brief overview, we can see that the early church fathers came from very different times and locations. For example, you have Clement of Rome, who lived in Italy, was born in AD 35 and died in 99 AD. You have Ignatius of Antioch, he was born in modern day Turkey and was killed in 107 AD. There was Athanasius of Alexandria, which is modern day Egypt, and lived from 293 AD till 373 AD. Then there was Augustine of Hippo, I know a funny name to us, who was born in Algeria and lived between 354 AD and 430 AD. This is not a complete list of all the early church fathers, but hopefully gives you an idea of the diversity we see among them. One important thing to note is that the early church fathers are not perfect, just as we are not perfect. They sometimes got things wrong. So we can learn from the good bits in their writings and we can question the not so good bits. Remember, they're not our ultimate source of authority. For Christians, the ultimate source of authority is scripture because it's given by God. But they are an example of what it means to follow Christ. And some are very important in our understanding of some of the deep truths of the Bible. They wrestled with beliefs and ideas that today Christians take for granted. And hopefully in future segments, we'll take a look at some of their writings. Ultimately, they are a reminder that all over the world, there have been Christians for 2000 years. So hopefully that was useful to you and in the future we'll have some more segments of what do we believe. Now in a moment we're going to turn to our Bibles, but first of all, um, this is going back two weeks ago, I put some questions at the end of the video and now I'm going to give you the answers. So the first question was, what places did people come from to see Jesus? Now there are a number of answers for this, so if you had either Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, Jordan, Tyre or Sidon or Galilee, then that would be acceptable uh, answers. The second question was, what did Jesus get into to escape the crowd? And from the last um, story that we looked at, Jesus got into a boat. And who did Jesus call the sons of thunder? And if you remember, we were looking at the call of the disciples, the 12 disciples, and specifically James and John, he called the sons of thunder. So hopefully that has reminded you of what we were looking at last time. When we were looking at the story of Jesus, we looked at people coming to him from all different regions. And we also looked at his calling of the 12 disciples. Well, today we're going to continue on in the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to look at two specific 
two specific um, stories. One, uh, where uh, people accuse Jesus of being demon-possessed. And the other is where we're seeing Jesus' interaction with his family. Now last time we finished at verse 19. This time we're going to start in Mark um, chapter 3. We're going to start from verse 22 to 30, which is with Jesus and his interaction with the scribes and Pharisees. And then the second part is going to be from verses 20 to 21 and 31 to 35. Because what Mark does is the... Um, the story of the Jesus dealing with the scribes and Pharisees comes in between Jesus dealing with his family. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you again to turn to Mark chapter 3. I'm going to start reading from verse 22. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. So once again we see Jesus interacting with the teachers of the law. And notice what it says in verse 23, that they came down from Jerusalem. So they travelled quite a way to see Jesus. But they didn't come with good intentions. They'd heard all about the miracles he'd been doing, and even most likely had seen some of the miracles that Jesus had doing where he'd been healing people. So they couldn't deny that he'd been doing this. But what they do do is that rather than realising that this power came from God, they say, as we see in verse 23, 22, sorry, he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. What they were saying was, Jesus is demon-possessed, and the only reason he is able to drive out spirits is because he has an evil spirit in him, inside him. Now, what Jesus does to refute, to argue, to show how wrong the thinking is of the teachers of the law, is he talks to them in parables. And this is what he says in verse 24 or 23. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, the end has come. And so what Jesus is saying there, to rebut, to um, correct what the teachers of the law are saying, is if I'm possessed by a, essentially what he means is, if I'm possessed by a demon, how would I be driving out demons? I'd be going against himself. Why would Satan be going against Satan? You know, a house divided against itself cannot stand, he says. And so the point he's making, if he was doing this by the power of Satan, then he'd be going against himself and he'd ultimately be defeating himself. It'd be like a, someone fighting themselves, trying to wrestle with themselves and trying to beat themselves up. That doesn't make sense. And so that's what Jesus is doing to point out to the teachers of the law that what they say is wrong. And then what he goes on to say is that, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house. Again, that's very simple to understand. If you want to go into to someone's house, if you want to take something from there, you first have to subdue the person who owns it, then you can deal with that house. Now, we must be... Uh, Clearly, Jesus isn't advocating for us to go and rob 
houses, Jesus doesn't advocate for violence against people's property. But this is an analogy and allegory, because the strong man's house is a reference there to um, the world, and the strong man would be Satan. Because this world is considered to be, um, Satan is considered to be, is considered to be the prince of this world. So he has some power in this world, this is his domain. But what Jesus is saying here by the fact that the strong man is tied up, is that actually Satan has been defeated. Now it's important to, to realise when dealing with Satan or the, the devil or evil things that we have a balanced approach. Some are very easy to dismiss the idea of Satan that he doesn't exist and just um, make a mockery of the idea. No, Satan is someone who is real, who has real power, which we see, for example, in the book of Job. But also to remember, Satan, although he has power, has limited power. And we shouldn't be worried or scared of thinking any bad thing, that every bad thing that happens to us, or Satan is doing this to me, or Satan is doing that, or he's causing me to do this. So we need to have that balanced view that yes, Satan is real, he has power, but his power is limited, he's not behind every single bad thing that happens. So Jesus is using this analogy to show how silly the teachers of the law are to use this analogy. Then he goes on to say, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. Now it's important here just to spend a couple of minutes on these few verses because often um, people can become very anxious when reading these verses. And I especially focus on the negative bit of what's called the unpardonable sin. Jesus says here, if we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. And many people can become worried, well, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? It's important to realise it's not something that happens by accident. We don't just commit it accidentally. Notice what Jesus is doing here. He's applying it to the Pharisees, that they've been given all this light. Jesus is doing these miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's actually the Holy Spirit that is working to do these miracles. But what the uh, teachers of the law have done, they've taken what the Holy Spirit is doing and blasphemed it by saying that actually no, it's Satan, it's evil that is doing these things. And so we see the teachers of the law are really hard-hearted. So to essentially to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to deny, forcefully, willfully deny the work that the Holy Spirit is doing, which is something very serious. And the Holy Spirit is the one who actually reveals the truth about Jesus. So any person who denies the truth of Jesus won't be forgiven in the sense that they remain in that state. It's not the case of something we do once and that's it. But it's that ongoing, that continual state of rebellion against God. A person who is in consistent rebellion against God, who doesn't change their ways, who doesn't repent, that person will not be forgiven. And we can easily focus on the negative bit and miss the importance of the positive. That the Jesus promises that all the other sins can be forgiven which is a great encouragement to us. If you think, okay, I've committed too bad a sin, God can't forgive me, Jesus can't forgive me. Jesus here is saying the opposite. All other sins will be forgiven. If we come to Jesus in sincere repentance and faith, our sins will be forgiven, no matter how badly we've acted. So we shouldn't worry, oh, I may have committed the unpardonable sin, I won't be forgiven, I've done something too bad. No, Jesus is using this as condemnation of people who willfully reject Jesus and the work that the Holy Spirit does. 
if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have committed your life to following him, then you are not committing the unpardonable sin. So hopefully that is from some encouragement to you. And should, so therefore you shouldn't be worried that you may commit the unpardonable sin. And so that's what we see here with the teachers of the law, their reaction to Jesus. We're now going to look at the reaction of Jesus' family to him. So if we can turn back to our Bible, it's going to read from verses 20 to 21, and then 31 to 35. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And so I explained earlier why I split this into two bits. But if we go back to verse 20, we see that Jesus and his disciples enter a house. And again, because he's so popular, people come to him, are crowding around for him so much that he's not even able to, to eat. Imagine that. You're at your, your table at home or wherever you have your, your dinner or your meal and there's so many people around, you're not even able to eat in peace. And when his mother and brothers hear about this, they come to Jesus and look at the words they say, they went to take charge of him. It wasn't just simply to go and remove Jesus from that situation. They wanted some form of control over what Jesus was doing because they said he is out of his mind. They saw what he was doing as crazy because they didn't quite understand the mission of Jesus. And then when they arrive, going back now to verse 31, when they arrive at the house, Jesus is informed his mother and brothers are there. Now what we would expect then at this point is that Jesus goes out to them to meet them. But he doesn't do that. He does something different. What is it that Jesus does? Well, if we look back to our Bibles, verse 33, he asks the question, who are my who are my mother and my brothers? Now to us, that seems a very silly question to ask because surely it's obvious who Jesus' mother is. That's Mary who gave birth to him. And surely it's obvious who his brothers are. They would have been known to the people there. So it may seem strange for Jesus to ask this. But then he goes on and says, then he looked around those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. He says, Those around him are his mother and brothers. They're his family. But what does he mean by it? What does he mean by calling these people his family? Verse 35 says, Whoever does God's will is my mother, this is my brother and sister and mother. What Jesus is saying here, because he's come to do the will of God, anyone else who does God's will can be considered part of Jesus' family. Now we can easily look at this and think Jesus is being disrespectful to his family. But that isn't Jesus' point. His main point is that his true family are those who do God's will. Actually what he's saying is, in terms of importance, God should be the most important thing in a person's life, even above family. Now that doesn't mean that gives us the right to behave badly towards our family, or we should be mean to them. But it means that God should be the most important, and then it comes to our family. And that can be hard for people. But also it's that encouragement that if we are following Jesus, if we're following God, we become part of this amazing family that is, that we have brothers and sisters all around the world. To me that is an, an amazing thing. One of the things that I like to do is I like to go skiing 
I haven't been able to do it a lot recently. I like to go skiing, usually in Europe, and I go with a, a Christian company. And the amazing thing, not only be able to do skiing, be able to see God's creation, but I get to meet with other Christians. We have that thing in common. We have that bond. We have that family um, togetherness. Even though we may have never met each other, we have that thing in common. That's a wonderful thing to be part of God's family. And it's really an encouragement, especially for those who have decided to follow Jesus, but that has caused animosity between them and their family. There are those who, when they decide to follow Jesus, their family will, for one reason or another, cut them off or make it very hard for them. So this can be an encouragement to those people that when you do become a Christian, you become part of this wonderful family. And it can be hard sometimes to, to go against our family and family pressures. I know for me, I'm in a very valued situation where um, my family, most of my family are Christians, are believers, so I'm not in one sense, by following Jesus, not going against um, many of what many of the people in my family would believe. But I know not everyone is in such a fortunate situation. But even if your family are to disown you or make things hard in being a Christian, the encouragement we can have is that we are part of God's family. And so hopefully that's of some um, encouragement to you. And again, as we go through Mark, we see all these different people coming into contact with Jesus. And we can see their reaction to him. And what Mark is doing, he's always getting us to kind of ask that question, well, who is this Jesus? Who is this man that does and says those things? Well, I hope you've learned something today. I'm going to, in a minute, just pray. because It's always good to commit our time to God. And then uh, um, I also put some questions at the end of this episode for you to answer to, um, for next week. Also something that I've just remembered to remind you of. If you're watching this on a, a Sunday, um, later today at 5 p.m., it's going to be a, a special service done by Thomas and Benjamin called light in the darkness so i'd encourage you to tune into that and also to send it to your friends and family etc but if you're watching this after sunday you can still tune into and watch that service and still send that to your friends and your family and if you ever want to get in contact with us you can email us at ye.wgcc at gmail.com that's ye.wgcc at gmail.com so i'll just close this episode with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for us having this opportunity to look at your word, to look at the life of Jesus. And Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can be encouraged that if we come to you and we uh, truly repent, that we can be forgiven of all our sins. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, that um, when we do become Christians, when we do truly turn to you, we become part of this wonderful family. So I just pray for um, this week, for all those watching this, they may truly understand what it means to follow you. And I pray you be with us as we go uh, through this week. So we ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So thank you for tuning in. Until next time.